Again, good evening. Barry's had a great afternoon. We have made it in our study through Exodus to chapter 26. If you'd like to turn there with me, we're going to try to move through some ground tonight um, and then finish this evening taking communion together. Again, as we're picking up, we're in the midst of, of God's instructions to Moses concerning the building of the tabernacle. And it's amazing. God's word is so majestic that he can speak to us through blueprints. Right? That, that's how impressive God's word is tonight. And so let's pray and let's ask him to do just that. Father, again, um, you've given us your word. It's all inspired. It's all God breathed. And so, Father, we just ask that the truth that you have for us, Lord, through these building plans for the tabernacle, Lord, that you would reveal yourself. And Lord, ultimately, we know they were to point us to um, the one who would be our ultimate tabernacle, and that's Jesus. And so, Lord, would you open our eyes and we let us see Jesus tonight as we look through these pages of your word. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you're a builder, and I know we have several builders in our body, you're into construction, you may be drawn to, to this section of Exodus, but for the majority of us, right, this is where our, our reading of the verses becomes read a few, skip a few, right? read a few, skip a few. If, if we're honest, um, again, looking at blueprints for most of us to just roll out some blueprint and look at it is not a lot of fun, unless it's the blueprints for a house you're building. Then those blueprints become exciting. It's a reminder for us, though on the surface these things don't look very exciting to us today, to the Israelites, this would have been very exciting because what they were reading about was the place in which God would dwell, how he would house himself among his people. It would be the place where God would dwell among his people, meet with his people. Now, we, we recognize this wasn't God's house in the sense that this is where God lived. We understand that, that God doesn't live in, in a house. Solomon said the heavens can't even contain the Lord. But through the tabernacle, God was making a way for his people to have their humanity and his divinity come together and have fellowship. And understanding that, that's what should be exciting and attention-grabbing for us because we recognize that that's a picture. That's a foreshadowing of the ultimate meeting place, the ultimate dwelling place between God and man. And as we said, that, of course, is the person, Jesus. So in all these pieces of furniture we're looking at, in all of these curtains and threads and materials and design, we see Jesus. Now, there's always the question, at least in my mind, well, why didn't God just go ahead and send Jesus? If, if, he, if he's the point, if he's the culmination, why not just go ahead and give him? Why go through a tabernacle? Why go through all these rituals and all these, these, these priests and offering, go through all that work and difficulty? Why not just skip the shadow and jump right to the substance? Well, I think one of the reasons is because the Lord needed to set some context for the coming of Jesus. He needed to prepare his people if Israel was going to appreciate, if they were going to understand the fullness of what would be provided in Jesus, they needed to understand, first of all, their character, and they needed to understand the character of their God. They needed to appreciate the holiness of God, and they needed to appreciate the unrighteousness of humanity. And God would teach them this through the tabernacle. Another reason that God also may have given them the tabernacle was to create anticipation, to create a deeper passion and yearning for Jesus. When's this going to be over? When can we stop making sacrifices? When is this going to be enough? Creating that hunger and that thirst for the day in which God would bring it all to fulfillment. And so God was teaching valuable, eternal truths that would make the gift of Jesus, his sacrifice, truly amazing once he arrived. And we have the advantage of being able to look back and see these things. And so last time, as we got into this, we looked at three pieces of furniture we looked at the Ark of the Testimony and the Holy of Holies. We looked at the table of showbread and the lampstand just outside the Holy of Holies. And I think we, we had this picture that we put up last week to kind of give an overview of how the, the whole tabernacle was, was laid out. But before God goes on to give any more instruction on the pieces of furniture, God's going to take a little detour. And he's going to give Moses instruction on the, the structure of the tabernacle itself. 
Now, now remember, the tabernacle proper was 40 feet long by 15 feet wide by 15 feet tall. It was essentially a tent. It was divided into two parts. You had the Holy of, of Holies, the inner part where the ark was. It was a perfect cube, 15 by 15 by 15. And then you had the outer court, the holy place, which was 30 by 15. And when God would move the camp to different sites through the wilderness, he would always park the, the tabernacle right in the center of the camp. And he would command the different tribes to, to camp around. And he had certain tribes on, on each side of the tabernacle. But the point was, the tabernacle was always to be in the center of, of the people. And it was a statement that, that the worship of God was to be the center of the life of Israel. That God's presence was to be the center. Just as his presence is today. And so the Lord now begins describing again the, the structure proper by describing the curtains or, or the covering, the, the tent that would be over the tabernacle. As we're going to see, there are four coverings. And once again, even in these, we will see Jesus. Verse 1 of chapter 26. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of, the, of fine woven linen, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, with artistic designs of cherubim, you shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits, the width of each curtain four cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain, on the selvage of one set. And likewise, you shall do on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. Fifty loops you shall make in the one curtain, and fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is on the end of the second set, that the loops may be clasped to one another. And you shall make fifty clasps of gold and couple the curtains together with the clasp so that it may be one tabernacle. And the good news is there is no quiz tonight over this. So for the first curtain, the first covering, if you will, over the tabernacle, God tells Moses, make it out of fine linen embroidered with blue, purple, and scarlet thread. God says it was to be a combination of 10 individual curtains. Each curtain, we're told, was 42 feet long and 6 feet wide. Remember, a cubit we talked about was a foot and a half in, 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 in length. There were to be two sets of five curtains that were to be held together with gold clasp. Again, designed within them were to be cherubim or, or angels. And this would be the inner covering of the tabernacle on which the next three curtains are going to cover. And so this covering of fine linen, the cherubim, the blue, the purple, the scarlet, these would only be visible from the inside. Only if you were inside the tabernacle, which meant only if you were a priest, could you see this covering. As the priest went in, they alone could see this incredibly beautiful scene. What was ultimately, we're to understand, a heavenly scene. This fine linen, the cherubim, the light, reflecting off the lampstand, reflecting off all the gold. It was, it was a picture of the heavenly throne room. And see, this is why the command to make cherubim on the mercy seat and now in the, in, in the cloth that would be the ceiling didn't break God's commandment to make images. Right? You can read this, you think, I thought God said back in the Ten Commandments you were to make no image. And then God just says, okay, I want you to make cherubim in the tabernacle. Well, understand, none of these images, first of all, were of God. And secondly... This was a model of heaven. And this fine linen, this fine white fabric, it symbolized the purity, the righteousness of heaven. Ultimately, we recognize the purity and the righteousness of the God of heaven, of Jesus. And we see this in other places in Scripture. Remember in Revelation 19, um, John writes about the bride of Christ. He says, and to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. This fine linen represented the righteousness of the people. And we, and we understand, we recognize that what made their acts righteous wasn't their good deeds. It wasn't their good behavior. We understand they're righteous because they've been clothed in. They've been covered in the righteousness of Jesus, his holiness, his purity had been credited to them. This was, again, the inner covering. On top of this now was a second covering. Verse 7, You shall also make curtains of goat's hair to be a tent over the tabernacle. You shall make 11 curtains. 
The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits, and the width of each curtain four cubits. The 11 curtains shall all have the same measurements. You shall couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves. And you shall double over the sixth curtain at the forefront of the tent. You shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set. And you shall make 50 bronze clasps, put the clasp into the loops, and couple the tent together that it may be one. The remnant that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the tabernacle. And a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side of what remains of the length of the curtains of the tent shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and on that side to cover it. Now, I believe we have a slide. I think it's the second slide that you can kind of see. I apologize. That's not your eyes. Okay, that picture is blurry. Um, I'm not trying to wig you out. Um, but sadly, it was the best picture I could find. I don't know what's wrong with um, Google. But you, get some, you give an idea of the different layers of curtain. The second curtain that covered the fine linen was a curtain of goat's hair. This would have been a very dark, um, thick, coarse covering. Now, as we read here, these coverings were, this covering was longer than the linen curtain. They were 45 feet by six feet. See, see, the linen curtain didn't go all the way to the ground. I think there's a picture there. Again, that curtain represents the heavenly throne room. It doesn't touch the ground. It doesn't touch earth. It's separate. It's distinct. But now this second covering of goat's hair would completely cover the fine linen and touch the ground. You know, it's another difference that these, these curtains wouldn't be held together with gold clasp, but the goat hair covering would be held together with bronze clasp. And though gold is the material, again, of heaven, of kings, bronze, we know, is the material, it's the metal of judgment. And that's exactly what this covering symbolized. The judgment that Jesus would one day bear for mankind's sin. Because remember, we see throughout the Old Testament, the goat was an animal of sacrifice. We see it all throughout the Old Testament. We see it specifically on the Day of Atonement that we talked about last week. Right? When the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and, and he would take the, the blood of a, a goat that had been sacrificed and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat to make atonement for the sins of the nation. Remember, he, he would come out and take a living goat, put his hand on that living goat as a symbolic transfer of the sins of the nation onto this goat, this scapegoat that would bear the penalty of the sin. And then that goat would be sent away into the wilderness, again, symbolically carrying the sin of the nation away for another year. And of course, Jesus, we know, would bear the judgment for our sin. He would be our scapegoat. He would take the punishment we deserved. And he would carry our sin away. Notice verse 14. You shall also make, here's covering number three, a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. So the last two coverings, we have a ram skin dyed red, and then on top of this, we have a covering of badger skins. Now, a ram, of course, was a male sheep. Its skin was to be dyed red. As we know throughout the scripture, red speaks of blood ultimately pointing to the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, whose life would be shed for our sin. You know, we think back to Abraham. Remember, he takes Isaac up to Mount Moriah, offer him as a sacrifice. Remember, he's about to plunge the knife, and God stops him. He says, no, don't do this, Abraham. And it says, Abraham turned and he looked, and there was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And remember, Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. God provided a ram to take the place of sacrifice for Abraham's son. And of course, Jesus, again, is symbolized by the, the goat skin. He would take our judgment. What does that mean? Well, in taking our judgment, it means he would die in our place because the Bible says the wages of sin, the judgment of sin is death. His blood was shed that we might live. Now, you notice something about these last two coverings. There's no measurements given to them in terms of what their length was to be, what their width was to be. And some have, have, have pointed out when it comes to this, this third covering of ram skin dyed red that there almost seems to be a picture there that's the idea because there's no length given. It's a picture that the blood of Jesus covers all of our sin. 
There, there's no sin. There's nothing we, we could do that's ever too evil, that's ever too much for the blood of Jesus not to cover, not to forgive. That the scripture says that, that we have a, a Savior who's cleansed us from all unrighteousness. No matter what you think you've done, as bad as it could be, or as horrible as you think that action was that, that you did, that you committed, that blood can cover it, it all. Now, on top of this was the final covering of badger skins. Now, you may have a note in your Bible. That, that there's some translation issues. You know, some say maybe this was sea cow. Some say porpoise. Um, badger skin seems to, seems to be best. The idea, what we do know for sure, is this would have been a very durable, weather-resistant covering, right? which makes sense, right? You're covering this wooden structure that's out in the elements all the time, moving it around. You needed protection. You needed covering. And so on the one hand, this, this final covering speaks of Jesus as our refuge, as our, as our protection, as our covering. But even more, this would have also been the most plain and unattractive of the coverings. You walk up and there's badger skin, you know. But it reminds us something very important about Jesus. What did Isaiah tell us in chapter 53? He told us that Jesus has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It speaks of his humanity. And so, so notice the progression of these coverings. Moving from the outside in, the outside covering, this badger skin, the humanity of Jesus, to the ram skin dyed red, to his blood that was shed, to the, to the goat skin shed for the judgment we deserve. And it's all sufficient. Why? Because of the fine linen shows us he's divine. He's the pure and righteous one to bring us into heaven, to bring us into the throne room. And again, take note, you couldn't see the glory. You couldn't see that, that curtain of fine linen unless you were on the inside. Again, from the outside, you would be like, who designed this? Some man had to do this. <laughs> Putting badger skin on the outside, I mean, come on. We can, we can find something a little more attractive than this. You couldn't see the beauty unless you entered in. And what a picture that is. That's how it is with the Lord. It's not until you and I are in Christ that we can begin to see the fullness of his glory. It's once we're in him and he's in us, then we can see his majesty. Then we can see his beauty. Well, that was the outer covering. Now the Lord turns to the structure on which the coverings, the curtains, would hang. And there's a lot of boards in this, and so hopefully it doesn't get, you don't get bored with it. Um, good job. And verse 15, and for the tabernacle, you shall make the boards of acacia wood standing upright. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the width of each board. And so these boards were going to be 15 feet high by two feet, three inches wide. Two tenons shall be in each board for binding one to another. Thus you shall make for all the boards of the tabernacles. Now, I'm not a builder at all, but I read that a tenon is kind of a projecting piece of wood that would come out of the side of the board that would insert into another piece, almost kind of like tongue and groove. These are how the boards would lock together. Remember, you didn't nail, you didn't nail these boards together. Why? Because you had to move it often. You don't have to crowbar. All right, we just nailed it together. All right, it's time to move again. All right, get the, get the hammers out. We've got to pull these nails out. No, they, they would lock in. So you could take them down easily, move them, put them back together. Verse 18, and you shall make the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south side. You shall make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, there shall be 20 boards. And there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. For the far side of the tabernacle, the west side, you shall make six boards. And you shall also make two boards for the two back corners of the tabernacle. They shall be coupled together at the bottom, and they shall be coupled together at the top by one ring. Thus it shall be for both of them. They shall be for the two corners. So there shall be eight boards with their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under each of the boards." So God's very specific. All right, we're doing 20 boards on the north and south side. On the back or the west side of the tabernacle, you have six boards with two in the corner, making a total of eight. 
And God says these boards, each board would rest on two sockets of silver. That is, these sockets of silver, they, they were the base. They were the foundation for the tabernacle. They weren't, these boards weren't to sit on the ground. They were to sit on these bases of, of silver. And remember in the scripture what silver is associated with. Throughout the scripture, we see silver is associated with redemption. We see it throughout the law. And just part of the law that we read here in Exodus, we saw it. It was, it was the redemption price very often. If you did something wrong, you owed somebody, you hurt their ox, you would pay with silver. It was a way to redeem. And what a picture this is of all the worship that would would take place in the tabernacle was to be built on the redemption of the Lord. Because it's redemption. That's the basis. It's the foundation of our drawing near to God. It's not drawing near because I've had a good day. It's not drawing near because I've been a good person. I've been nice. Not drawing near because, well, I did all my rituals. I jumped through all the religious hoops you gave me, God. That was never the basis of drawing near. The basis of drawing near to God, the foundation, is always redemption. It's what God did. It's what he purchased to bring us back to himself. Notice verse 26. And you shall make bars of acacia wood, Five for the boards on the one side of the tabernacle, five for the boards, excuse me, boards on the one side of the tabernacle, five bars for the boards on the side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the far side westward. Okay, so these are the horizontal slats that would go through the vertical boards again to hold them together to bring stability. Verse 28, the middle bar shall pass through the midst of the boards from end to end. You shall overlay the boards with gold, make their rings of gold as holders for the bars, and overlay the bars with gold. And you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. And so again, God making very clear that these instructions were to be followed. Because this was more than just about design. This was more than about just making sure that this building could stand in case a strong wind came through. It was pointing to eternal truce. In verse 31 now, we come to, to the doors of the entryways. They were to be a part of the tabernacle. And you shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasp. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. So we can go back to that, that first picture that we have, the one before that, and there we go, okay? So we're looking at the entryways into the Holy of Holies, and then we'll see the entryway into the holy place. But notice God says the first barrier, again, into the, the Holy of Holies, that place that the high priest could only go on that once a year on the Day of Atonement, was to be a divider. It was to be a separation, a recognition it's a fearful thing, a recognition that it's, a, it's an ominous thing to go into God's presence. And, and what they would do, because it was so fearful and ominous, they would actually tie a rope around the leg of the high priest in case he got in there and he messed up. He did something that didn't make God happy or, or God wasn't happy with the sacrifice and he struck him down because nobody's going in there to get him. I'm not going, you going, I'm not going, you going. And so they would take a rope, right? And if he kills over... And you quit hearing the bells jingle on the bottom of his robe, you'd pull him out. Because that's what a fearful thing it was. To go into God's presence. This was, this was reserved. This was restrictive. We see the, the veil was to be woven with blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine linen. And much, much like that, that inner covering. But these, these thread colors are very significant. Blue is the color of heaven. Purple is the color of royalty, and of course, red is the color of blood. And so notice the picture there. The high priest would enter in through the blood of the heavenly king. What a picture from the beginning. It was never the blood of that goat. That wasn't the reason you could come in. Because he was picturing the blood of the heavenly king who would one day give his life. 
And again, it was the dividing wall showing coming to God's presence. It's no ordinary thing. It's a, it's a sacred thing. It's limited for a certain time and a certain person. Now, later, of course, when the tabernacle gave way to the temple, and when you had a permanent structure, the, the temple was much larger, and so the veil was much larger. And we're, and we're told by other sources that in the time of Jesus, the, the veil was 60 feet tall by 30 feet wide and four inches thick. And yet you remember what the Gospels tell us, that the very moment that Jesus gave up his spirit, breathed his last on the cross, that veil was torn in two. And again, the Bible is very specific to tell us not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom, showing this was the work of God. This was a divine work. And in that moment, at the sacrifice of Jesus, the veil, the dividing wall between God and man was torn. No more would there be a barrier which limited access to God to a certain time and a certain person. But now every single one of us, no matter our social status, no matter our occupation, no matter our income, no matter our race, any time we want can come into God's presence, not because of who we are, but again, because of Jesus, our high priest, who went in with his own blood rather than with the blood of goats having no sin of his own to atone for, was able to make the ultimate atonement for our sin. It's a radical reality. You know, we haven't had to live with it, but it's a radical reality. When you understand what the Jews saw and were continually told, you can't go into God. There's one man, one time a year. And yet now, your alarm goes off at 6 a.m. in the morning. Or some of you, maybe 10 a.m., I don't know. Um, right? And you still got sleepy in your eye. And, and you still got drool hanging out the side of your mouth on your pillow. And you're in your Scooby-Doo pajamas, right? And you can roll over and you can call out to the Lord. And in that moment, in that state, you're in the throne room of heaven. You have access to the God of creation. And he has your full attention. It's a radical truth when you understand what that veil symbolized, the separation and understanding that we now, the reason for it is because we have a new veil. Right? Jesus is our veil. He's our entrance into fellowship with God. Hebrews 10, verse 19 through 20 puts it this way. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Well, there's one more in opening into the tabernacle. Verse 36 says, You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine woven linen, linen made by a weaver, and you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood, overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. As so you notice, at the end of the tabernacle was also a doorway, also a veil, a screen. You notice it, it looked exactly the same as the doorway into the Holy of Holies. And, and, and it would have stood out. Right? You could have seen it from, from the courtyard. You could have seen that entryway, that veil. And I think there's even a picture here in this. Yes, Jesus was just human. Yes, there was nothing of outward beauty that you would just stop and say, well, I want to follow that guy just by a quick look. Nothing to attract us to him. But for those who wanted to find Jesus... They saw something different. You remember in the Gospels that those who wanted to know God, those who had a spiritual hunger, they saw that there was something different about Jesus, right? He had a different authority. He, he, had a, he had a glory. He had a wonder about him. He had an amazement. They saw things others didn't see. And so, again, there's this picture in the midst of that which looks so ordinary. For those who were looking, there was this beautiful screen that would draw one's attention, even in the tabernacle. Also take note, there was only one way into the tabernacle. One door, just as there's only one way to salvation, one way to relationship with God. You know, I was listening to Pastor Damien Kyle this week, and he's talking about how people get so upset about the fact that there's only one way and just how horrible that is. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't God make more than one way? That would be fair. That would be right. And he said, we, we've got our thinking flipped. Instead of thinking, why didn't God make more ways? He should have made more ways. We should be just blown away by the fact that he even made a way. He even gave us one way to access him. We don't deserve that way, but God in his grace has made it available. 
Chapter 27, we're still moving. You shall make an altar of acacia wood five cubits long, five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. You shall overlay it with bronze. You shall also make its pans to receive its ashes, its shovels, its basins, its forks, and its fire pans. You shall make all its utensils of bronze. You shall make a grate for it, a network of bronze. And on the network, you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners. You shall put it under the rim of the altar beneath that the network may be midway up the altar. And you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. The poles shall be put in the rings, and the poles shall be on the two sides of the altar to bear it. You shall make it hollow with boards. As it was shown you on the mountain, so shall they make it. And so now we turn to another piece of furniture, and I think we have a, a picture of it. You see it's in, in the front there. This is the bronze altar. Four and a half feet high, seven and a half feet long and wide. This was the first piece of furniture those who entered the courtyard would have seen. Now remember, you could enter the courtyard. That's where you brought your sacrifice. That was allowed. Only the priest got into the holy place. Only the, the high priest got into the holy of holies. But you could come into the courtyard of the tabernacle. But it was the very first thing you would be confronted with. And what you were confronted with immediately is that the reality is I can't get close to God without a sacrifice. It was an immediate reminder that sin can't be ignored. It was an immediate reminder God takes sin seriously. You weren't there to meet with God because you deserved it. It was an immediate reminder, hey, I don't measure up. I don't have what it takes. Right? The Bible tells us that on our best day, our righteousness is as filthy rags before him. It was a reminder that God's not going to get to the end of, of time and say, hey, you know what, you know, I know I gave these standards, but, but you tried hard, and, and you know, I, just forget that standard. Just, just, just come on in. It's a reminder, no, God takes sin seriously. Sin has to be dealt with. But at the same time, it was a reminder that God's a merciful God because he made a way for a substitute to be offered. And so all those years of bringing animal after animal to sacrifice, a constant reminder, again, sin's a big deal, and sin brings death. But at the same time, a reminder that God's merciful, and he provides a substitute. And see, when you understand that, you understand why Jesus had to die. You understand why his death is necessary. Notice on this altar, God says on each corner there was to be a horn. Now the horns we see oftentimes in, in the Old Testament is where they would apply the blood. It would also be a place of refuge that people would run to. There's examples in Scripture when somebody was in trouble, right? and they would run, and they would hold on to the horn of the altar because the altar is a place of mercy. So they're saying, I need mercy in this moment. Spare me, show me mercy. It was the idea, again, of, of hanging on, just as the Lord is our place of mercy. And, and in Psalm 118 and verse 27, we read this, God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. And, of course, we know the type is clear. Jesus would be that ultimate sacrifice. He would be bound on the cross. He would die in our place. But may I remind us, though Jesus would be bound to, the, to his altar, the cross, he ultimately wasn't bound with cords or he wasn't ultimately bound with nails. We understand he was bound with love. Those nails didn't hold him. He didn't need those nails. He didn't need the Romans to throw him on there. We know he was in charge. We know he was in control. He proved that the night before in the garden when they came to arrest him. And they said, are you Jesus? And he said, I am. And they all fell to the ground. It was love that bound him to the horn of that altar. It was love that caused him to die for you and for me. In verse 9, now we look at the, the court of the, of the tabernacle. You shall also make the court of the tabernacle. For the south side there shall be hangings for the court made of fine woven linen, 100 cubits long for each side, and its 20 pillars and their 20 sockets shall be bronze. The hooks of the pillars and their bands shall be silver. Likewise, also the length of the north side there shall be hangings 100 cubits long, with its 20 pillars, there are 20 sockets of bronze, and the hooks of the pillars, and their bands of silver. And along the width of the court on the west side shall be hangings of 50 cubits, with their 10 pillars and their 10 sockets. The width of the court on the east side shall be 50 cubits. The hangings on one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits, with their three pillars and their three sockets. And on the other side shall be hangings of 15 cubits, with their three pillars and their three sockets. And again, understand, books and books have been written on the significance of all these things. 
And you can, you can go deeper in them if that's something you're drawn to and all the pictures of, of Jesus. But just here in this courtyard, the, the courtyard itself was 75 feet by 150 feet. And these hangings, the idea is that the fence around it was a cloth fence. So again, there was a separation. You could tell that, that the, 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 the tabernacle structure, the, the, the whole area proper was distinct. And then notice the entrance into the tabernacle, verse 16. For the gate of the court, there shall be a screen 20 cubits long, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. It shall have four pillars and four sockets. Now, again, that should sound very familiar, right? The same entrance into the courtyard was the same entrance into the holy place. It was the same entrance into the holy of holies. And again, notice one entrance into the courtyard. Now, this entrance it's very interesting. It was to the east. It was on the eastern side of the courtyard where the tribe of Judah was camped. What a picture again of Jesus, the one of the tribe of Judah who is the way to God. And verse 17 says, And all the pillars around the court shall have bands of silver. Their hooks shall be of silver, their sockets of bronze. The length of the court shall be 100 cubits, the width 50 Throughout in the height five cubits made of fine woven linen, its sockets of bronze, all the utensils of the tabernacle for all its service, its pegs, and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. And again, this medal of judgment. In verse 20, And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. In the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. Now, the Lord returns back to something we already looked at, at the lampstand that stood just outside the Holy of Holies in, in the holy place. And he does that because he's going to transition now to give Moses instruction concerning the, the priesthood in the next several chapters. But we recognize for the lamp to burn there obviously had to be oil required. And this lamp, Moses is told, is going to burn 24-7. It's going to burn from evening until morning, which means it's going to require a lot of oil to burn. But the Lord says here, it's not just any type of oil you can use. Right? You can't just go down to Sam's right, and load up on the deal of the day for oil for this lamp. It's a very specific oil. It was to be, we're told there in verse 20, to be a pure oil of pressed olives. I submit to us, even in the oil, we see Jesus. It was pure oil. This was the finest oil that came from the olive. Jesus, of course, was pure. Jesus was sinless, perfectly righteous, the best the Father had to offer. And not only was it to be pure oil, it was to be from pressed olives. They would take the olive and they would put it in a mortar and, and, and they would apply pressure against it. And they would extract this, this, this prime oil that came out before it got all smashed down in, into, the, into the pit and all of the, the skin. Jesus, of course, would be pressed. The weight of God's judgment we know for our sin would fall upon him. Remember, he was in an olive garden, not the restaurant, right? in a literal olive garden. Right? The night of his arrest, the Bible says he began to sweat drops of blood because of the pressure the reality of the cup he was about to drink, the fact that he was going to take the wrath of God and be separated from his father for the first time fell upon him in a little garden there where they crushed olives. Isaiah speaks of him being bruised, crushed for our iniquities. And so this oil that would, that would light the lampstand was from a pure pressed vessel, just as the oil, a representation of the Holy Spirit that lights and fuels our lives, is the result of the perfect Son of God crushed for us. As a result of the work of Jesus, the empowerment of the Spirit is given to, to you and I to work in and through us. And just like that lamp is to be a continuous flow, right? Paul tells in Ephesians, be ye continually filled. It's to continually empower us and equip us to shine the Lord's light, never to run out. Right? In Christ, we're the tabernacle, we're the temple of God. It's the Holy Spirit that shines through us to light the way to God's presence and not only to light our way to God's presence, but then we have the privilege to shine that light to others to show them the way as well. It's amazing what we see in the tabernacle. 
Jesus is our mercy seat. Jesus is our bread of fellowship. Jesus is the light. Jesus, as those coverings show us, took on our flesh. His blood was shed for our judgment that we might share in his heavenly life. He's the veil through which we can come to God's throne. He's the sacrifice that's offered for us. He's the only entrance into God's presence. He's the pure and pressed one that allows our lives to be filled with God's very spirit. He's our tabernacle. He's our way to now dwell with God. And I'm reminded of John chapter 2 where you know, Jesus goes in the first time and overturns all the, the tables and messes up the, all they've got going on there in, in, in the temple, again, which was the fulfillment of the, of, the, of the tabernacle, the completion of the tabernacle. And remember the Jews, Jewish leaders, they challenged him. like, what do you think you're doing? What gives you a right? Show us some sign that you have the right to do what you just did. And remember Jesus said, okay, you want a sign? Here's the sign. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. And then they really flipped out because they're like, what are you talking about? It's taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you're just going to tear it down now, and, and you're going to put it back together in, in three days? And you remember John wrote this. He says, but he, Jesus, was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had said. One of the things Jesus was making clear there is there was a greater temple, or we could say tabernacle, in their midst. They were all stoked. We've got, we've got this temple. We've got this building. We're something special. This is where it's at. And Jesus was trying to get them to understand, no, 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 no. This is, this is just a shadow. This is to straw. This is to give way to someone much greater. This building is simply a shadow of the true place of meeting with God. The true dwelling of God is now in your midst, and it's me. And of course, it would be because he would be destroyed. It would, because, it would be because he would be crucified and put to death, and then three days later be raised to life, that we have access to God. That we now can come through him into God's presence. We can now draw near. Because again, Jesus didn't just enter into a holy place made of hands. He didn't just take that blood into a building. He entered in, Hebrews tells us, after dying on that cross, into the very throne room of heaven. And before the holy God. Not, not before a box made out of wood covered in gold. Before the, before the holy throne of God, he offered his blood. He offered his life. And because his blood was accepted for those who will receive his blood, for those who will allow his blood to be sprinkled on them, we are now accepted as well. We now have an entryway made into God's very presence now and for all eternity. And that's what we remember tonight. And that's what we celebrate when we take communion. So I want to pray. After I pray, I want to invite you to come forward. There's, there's three stations here. Um, there's also a station of the, of the prepackaged um, juice and cracker, if you would like that. And as the worship team leads us in another song, come and get that and take it back into your, to your seat, and then we'll come back up and take communion together, remembering Jesus, our tabernacle, the one who's made a way for us to draw near. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, again, this is um, a lot of details, and um, it's easy to get lost in all of these things, God, and we know it doesn't mean as much for us as it did for, for the Jews receiving this, but in some ways it means more because we, you've opened our eyes and you've let us see the fulfillment of all of this. All this perfect planning and building, God, was to point to the one that you would send, your very son, who would tabernacle among us, take on our flesh, and live in this world, a pure and sinless life, and then die on that cross to be that final sacrifice, to be that, that ultimate substitute to make atonement for our sin so that our sin could be removed and so that your righteousness could be accredited to us and that we can now, right here in this place, call out to you through Jesus and know that we have your attention. And not that we have your attention, Lord, but we have your salvation. We have eternal security that we are going to be with you, Lord. We, we're just still tasting a shadow of what's going to be ours one day when we are in your presence. When we get to walk into your throne room, God, 
not because of what we are, but in spite of who we are, because of what your son has done. And so we want to remember what he has provided for us tonight, Lord. We want to remember his body, his blood shed for us. And so, Lord, speak this truth to us. Lord, you know what we need to hear tonight. And so you work in our hearts by your spirit. And we thank you now as we prepare to remember you. In Jesus' name we pray.